Hi there, welcome. It's a privilege to be here today. Uh, Biofuels, Whiskey and Me, not a title I've ever used before, especially for you. Let's take them one at a time. Uh, biofuels, here's a little techie bit for you. What we currently do, what many of you have done to get here today, is that you use fuel in transportation. Now, we get that fuel by digging up fossil fuel, oil typically, that's buried under the ground. We convert it into transportation fuel, and then when we burn it, we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, that carbon dioxide will not go into the atmosphere unless we dig up the oil and convert it into transportation fuel. What naturally occurs in nature is that plants breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. And that carbon dioxide that they absorb becomes part of the plant. So the simple premise behind biofuels is, what if we take the carbon that's now embedded in the plant material, which has come from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we convert that into a fuel, and then when we burn the fuel, we're simply returning the same carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. It's not new carbon dioxide, it was already in the atmosphere. That way, we can prevent a net increase in carbon emissions, but it's a little bit more than that. How many countries in the world actually have oil? And how many of us are dependent upon oil for our existence? They're completely different numbers. Most of the countries, most countries in the world that do not have oil, cannot get their hands on it unless they access other countries. But you can get access to biological material, which means if you have your own supply of biological material that you can convert into fuel, you can develop your own energy security. And then there's one that nobody can really argue about. You heard it here first today, folks. Oil is a finite resource. It's going to run out. And man did not come out of the Stone Age simply because he ran out of rocks. We need to find new ways of sustaining energy supplies around the planet that will remove our complete dependence on oil. If anyone thinks that this is a brand new idea that was brought in recently as a fad to combat uh, climate change, well, this is the original patent for the diesel engine, which Rudolf Diesel brought out in the late 1800s, and it ran on peanut oil. The internal combustion engine developed in the 1800s ran in bioethanol, and the first mass-produced car, the famous Model T Ford that Henry Ford developed, ran on bioethanol, and Henry Ford was a biofuel producer. And it was Henry Ford's vision to build a vehicle affordable to the working family and powered by a fuel that would boost the rural farm economy. Had prohibition gone slightly differently in America way back then, we might have a different fuel structure in the world today, but history has shown us otherwise. So that's biofuel, what on earth has it got to do with me? Well, here's my very first tenuous link for the afternoon. I was born in a small town in County Cork, 20 miles away from the Ford family home. So I went to uh, university, I'm a microbiologist by training. I went to university in Cork, did microbiology there, did quite well, did my PhD, and may have pursued the traditional academic route and gone back into universities and lectures and all that. But I did something slightly different. I went into industry, I moved to Copenhagen, a beautiful city in Scandinavia, where I worked for a very large biotech firm called Novozymes. And it was there that I learned how to empower scientific ideas, to take a scientific research concept and translate it into something that was real and practical and delivered to the rest of the world. A number of things about that. One is it's a mindset. You need to think about research concepts for their practical output. But then you also have a few technical things you need to learn about patenting and IP protection and all that. So I developed those skills while I was there. I also met my wife in Copenhagen, which was the most important thing that happened. And together, <laughs> we moved to uh, Scotland eventually. And uh, we came to live in Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland. It's a beautiful city. And I was very fortunate to get a job in a university there, Edinburgh Napier University, which is one of the modern universities that's more aligned to the application of science. And that suited me quite well. While I was there, I developed a new research interest and that was on something called the acetone butanol ethanol fermentation. It's just like making beer, it's just you make a different set of compounds at the end. So the bacteria that we put into the fermentation mixture will convert the sugars that are in that substrate, whatever it may be, and they, instead of making just ethanol like you would in beer or wine, they'll make acetone, butanol, and ethanol. The stimulus for this as an industry came uh, in the First World War, where acetone was needed uh, to provide explosives uh, in the First World War, and again, the Second World War followed on very quickly afterwards. So by the end of the Second World War, this biological process was the second biggest biological process that the world had ever seen at its peak. Only the drinks industry was bigger than this as a fermentation process. Uh, it died out because it couldn't compete with the ever-growing and increasing petrochemical industry, 
and also because the cost of the raw material that you typically put into those substrates got more and more and more expensive. And that's where things might have finished for me. I might have had a good job in a good university tinkering away around the edges of a dead process until a gentleman by the name of David Ramey in 2005 drove what I'm reliably informed is a Ford Buick. I don't know anything about cars. But he drove this car 10,000 miles around America fueled entirely with butanol. Now, it turns out that butanol is actually quite a good fuel. Compared to bioethanol, it has way more energy. Um, you don't have to change the infrastructure in order to distribute it. You can put it into cars, as David did, completely unmodified. He ran 100% butanol. Or you can put it in and blend it with petrol. So in the Olympics in London last year, the courtesy cars for the athletes, they were run on a blend of butanol and petrol. You can also blend it with diesel. And it turns out it's a pretty good base unit for making jet fuel for aviation fuel. So here you have something that's now got a new market as an advanced biofuel, and historically we know for sure we can make this at scale. Which then would have you thinking that all the world's leading biobutanol experts were furiously working away, driving forward research, working with all the other stakeholders, governments and industry, and making sure that they get fantastic careers out of it, and that this would become a fantastic new global industry, except there's a slight problem. In uh, May 2006, just after David had done his iconic drive around the States, this was the world's population of biobutanol experts. It was our biannual conference. We didn't even have enough people to do this every year. <laughs> it was a biannual conference. And I was very fortunate that, although I had a little bit more hair in those days, I was one of that motley crew. <laughs> and then I looked and I thought, well, this actually creates a problem because all of these stakeholders are operating in a void. Unless you want to think of it not so much as a problem, but an opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime chance for me to do something different and to boldly go where no one had gone before. Because if you could bring these sectors together in some way, then you could do something completely different. So I started looking at this and developing it as a concept, and first it was all about butanol, but then I realized that the whole biofuel industry in Scotland back in 2006 was working in disassociated stakeholder areas. So I thought, OK, let's get my idea and make it even bigger and better. And I thought, if I could bring all of these together in some sort of an entity that would allow them to coordinate their activities so that the message was straight, the policy was in line with the industry needs, the research was focused on what the industry would need that would match the policy and grow the whole biofuel sector in a sustainable way in Scotland, that this would be something new and novel that had not been done before. So I called it my idea, the Biofuel Research Center. Uh, but it was as much about communication and business development as it ever was to do with research. Maybe I should have named it something differently in hindsight, but it's a name I'm quite proud of these days. Captain Kirk had a starship and a crew. I had a wing and a prayer. I was starting from a blank sheet. I kind of developed this great idea that no one had ever tried before, and I thought, oh, yeah. This would be so good, but I didn't quite know how to bring it to fruition. How did I empower this particular idea? I spoke to my colleagues in the university, and even if they thought it was a good idea or not, any time I spoke to somebody, they came up with a hundred new reasons why it would never work. <laughs> I was beginning to think, whoops. And then I realized, you know, if you're going to think outside the box, you have to be prepared to act outside the box. This couldn't be built from the ground up. It couldn't be done from me telling everybody else, make it happen for me. I would have to do it. And to do that, I would need complete support. I would need people from the very top of all these different organizations that I was talking about to back me. I would need all the stakeholders to align up, and I would need firm political backing. I needed a government minister to stand beside me and say, this is a good idea. I can empower that idea. So now I knew what I needed to do. I still hadn't a clue how to do it. And that's where my wife came in. They say behind every great man is a great woman. Well, I'm not saying I'm a great man, but I am married to a great woman. And she said, you have one tool in this particular toolbox, and it's networking. Now, networking to me in 2006 was this dark, murky world that I knew nothing at all about. I'm the guy in the corner with the glass of wine, talking to his best mate, drinking away, chatting about football, praying to God the event was over. I'm not the person walking up to some influential stranger in the room and trying to impress upon them the significance of an idea that I may or may not ever be able to bring to fruition. But that's what I needed to do. And my wife kicked me out of the house, locally, nationally, and even internationally, when we needed to do it, to send me around the place and try and build a momentum and sell that concept to people. 
My standard excuse is, well, that event has nothing to do with biofuel, and I won't know anybody there anyway. Turns out, of course, these are exactly the reasons why you need to go to these networking events. And I did. And I met so many influential, wonderful people who changed my life. And I came from the darkness into the light, and I discovered the power of networking and people who can help to empower ideas. And so over a number of years, I cajoled and smoothed my way through uh, that world and, and while holding down a, my straightforward job as a university lecturer at the same time and having a young little child we were trying to bring up and my wife still sending me out there, I learned three major lessons during that period. Firstly, that was completely wrong. There's no such thing as unrelated events. When you hear some of the speakers that will come on, they will tell you about empowering their ideas. It's irrelevant whether they're artists, musicians, sportsmen, politicians. That whole concept of taking a good idea that you have and bringing it through to fruition, you're all going to hit the same type of mental blocks and prohibition in front of you that says this cannot happen. And it's getting through those barriers. That's the message you need to learn. And these are the things that I needed to understand. Uh, I was doing something different. Of course, nobody else had done it. So you have to learn from people who had. Second thing I learned is that you're never actually talking to an individual anyway. You're speaking face to face with one person, but you're addressing everybody else that they know in their network. And the number of times that wonderful people that I've spoken to at events have come back and through a third party, a day later, a week later, or maybe many years later, have had a huge influence in my life because they communicated that message on further. And then the third thing I learned, the most important, is that my wife is always right which I think is the topic of a completely different TED talk, but one that I'm nowhere near brave enough to give. <laughs> and so at the end of all this, nearly two years later, I did bring together the right people. And this time, the very top of the university, the principal was right behind me. A government minister from Scotland, a government minister from Westminster, they were all behind me, the captains of industry were there. And with their collective power, and borrowing money and cajoling people to give it to me. I got my best mate to design the logo for me for free, which he did. We grew up together in Macroon. And then finally, by pulling all these little things together, the Biofield Research Center was born in 2007, on December the 10th. And then once it started, it took on a life of its own. And again, it was all about other people. The people I brought in, a fantastic team of people over the last five and a half years who've worked in this center with me. And it did do what it said we wanted to do. We created new jobs in Scotland, we built the industry, we've helped advise government policy, we've helped grow the whole sector, we've redefined the research focus in this area, and they are all now getting more and more and more coordinated to bring sustainable biofuel to the market. So I'd never ask anyone to do something I wouldn't do myself. Let me give you a very specific idea of how the Biofuel Research Centre took a simple research idea and brought it to, to commercial reality. Q Whiskey. Um, no, I didn't invent whiskey, <laughs> although I do love to tell the Scots that the Irish did, and being Irish, obviously, that's a good one. Uh, but whiskey has been made exactly the same way for hundreds of years. Three simple ingredients. You have uh, barley, yeast, and water. You malt the barley to release some sugar, you add yeast and water and do a fermentation to make a beer, and then you distill out the alcohol and you mature that. However, less than 10% of what comes out of the distillery is actually the alcohol and the rest are low value or useless byproducts and residues. Now this is one of the biggest industries in the country and it's continually pumping out all of these things that have no value and I thought well this got carbon in there which means it's got energy which means we can make fuel out of it. So one of the big products is the rest of the barley which is called draft and then behind that you get when you distill off the alcohol a liquid called pot ale. And what we developed in the biofuel center was a way of combining those two using the ABA fermentation and making biobutanol from these completely useless waste products. And we did the research, and any university could probably have done that for you if they had the skills in the ABE fermentation, which not too many had, as you all know. But it was more important than that. The Biofuel Center allowed this concept to grow much further. We provided it with the market analysis, the business case, everything we needed to do to bring this to fruition. And then last year, the Biofuel Center spun out its very first company, and it's called Celtic Renewables. And if any of you recognize any synergy, in the logos, because my best mate did that for me as well, but at least this time I was able to pay him for it. <laughs> um, and the company was born with a gift. It was born with a gift of automatic stakeholder alignment and political backing because the Biofuel Research Centre provided it, because that's what it was designed to do. Um, it was launched last year by our Energy Minister, Mr Fergus Ewing, 
And this lady, Dr. Lena Wilson, who's uh, one of the most important women in Scotland, she's the chief executive of our business agency called Scottish Enterprise. And this other chap is Mark Simmers. Uh, the idea that an academic comes up with a good scientific concept, translates it into a commercial applicable, applicable um, entity, then automatically inherits a business degree overnight that allows you to run a company. I just don't get that. So employ a proper guy, and that's what I did. I got Mark in, he's my CEO. And then we told the world. And the world loved this idea. And television crews for the last uh, year or two have been calling over to Edinburgh and knocking on the door of the Barfield Research Center at Edinburgh Napier University, coming in and filming that story. Because it's a good story. It's a simple concept that people can get. And it translates an idea and empowers that idea. We won numerous awards. Um, so we got vindication from other people as well. We were validated by the industry itself and innovation awards. And I got to meet very interesting people and chat about it. Um, I met with Al Gore. Now, Vice President Gore did not phone up and say, hey, Martin, I need to talk to you about biofuel. Didn't happen that way. <laughs> Lena Wilson introduced me to Al Gore. And I met Lena Wilson right here in Hong Kong, because she was introduced to me by Fiona Donnelly at one of those big events that I didn't want to go to, and my wife kicked me out the door to go to it. <laughs> and so that's where we've ended up. It's been a strange, um, fascinating, and very worthwhile journey bringing that idea through to reality. It hasn't always been plain sailing, and you will have times where you stumble. They're the simple things, where things aren't working out, and you've got problems, and people are in your way, and all that kind of usual thing. But there are deeper bits of it as well. There were times where only my wife would see this, where I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd go, they got the wrong guy. <laughs> you know? All these people, senior influential people, putting their faith in me, and, and I'd fear this responsibility. And I'd think, well, why me? They got the wrong guy. I can't do this anymore. And what Anna made me realize is that it's the opposite side of the same coin where people will always see passion and commitment and dedication to what you're doing. This is just the other side of that coin. And some days the coin's going to land one way rather than the other. And when I didn't believe myself, she always did. So believe in what you're doing and go ahead and empower your own ideas. My friends and family got the old detail bit. I used to give them the old nippy thing. I could moan for Ireland if I really wanted to <laughs> and complain about things. But it was about details, about the problems along the way. And everything you do is going to encounter problems. But Martin Luther King didn't inspire generations of people by saying, I have a 10-point business plan. No, he had a dream. The details can be worked out, and people are there to help you. Keep your eye on your dreams. Allow good people to help you bring a good idea to fruition, and people can empower good ideas. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you later.